come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you for the beauty and the wonder of this terrific book that's in front of us. And Lord, I ask that you would help me to show your great wisdom and truth in everything that's said. Lord, would you be the breath of our words and would you be the thoughts that overtake our mouth so that it would be as if you were speaking and that we would even be having the Holy Spirit speak through us. We thank you for your great invitation to open your book and just love it. We thank you most of all for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. We are entering into the really good part of Ezekiel. And I don't mean that in a bad way because God's Word's all good. But we've been in some dire spots. And let me explain a little bit for those that are new, new and review for myself. You all know me well enough to know that as a fifth grade teacher, I review, 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 review. And that's some point back itself because I need it. Ezekiel was taken in the third, second siege of Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar, the, the whole world was ruled by him. It was called Babylon. Came up and he took them three sieges to get Jerusalem taken captive. First siege, our friend Daniel was taken. Taken clear down to the southern part of Babylon. Chaldea is Babylon. And he was taken and given into the court of Nebuchadnezzar as a young man, maybe 13, 14. But Nebuchadnezzar wasn't 20. So they became instant friends and 70 years later, we see Nebuchadnezzar get saved because of what Daniel does. In the second siege, which was about 12 years later, the priests were taken. And this would have been Ezekiel and his wife and his father. He was trained to be a priest. He was 25 years old when he was taken. He wasn't old enough to do his office. He had to be 30. Those of you that know this story know the reason Jesus didn't start his ministry till the age of 30 is because that's the Jewish law. You are not a priest until you're 30. You're trained until that point. Jesus is priest, prophet, and king. And he couldn't start his ministry because he's Jewish till he was 30. So when Ezekiel's taken captive, he can't be a priest. He's trained to be. God said, that's right, I call you to be a prophet. And a prophet he is. You will remember that at the same time he's prophesying to wayward Israel, up in the north, still in Jerusalem, is Jeremiah. You may have heard of him. Down in the south, our friend Daniel prophesying and preaching to Nebuchadnezzar. And then at the northern part where he's taken captive of the, of the Chaldean area, there's a big reservoir called Chibar. And that's where Ezekiel's taken. We like to call it kind of like a refugee camp for millions of people. And that's where he's preaching. And he not only is preaching, he's prophesying. Because right off, he says, And the Lord said to me. And we're going to get more of this tonight. So we've gone past the first few years of this. His wife has died. He's a master sidewalk prophet. Because what he does is he acts out stuff. He does little Legos. He cuts his hair off and burns it. He lays on his side. He, it's, he is just, you need to go back and read the first part if you haven't. Because... God didn't have any other medium to get his story across, so he used Ezekiel's play acting, and he is a master. When we read his words, it's poetry, it's synonyms, it's homilies, it's praises, it's woes, it's funeral dirges. He writes like Isaiah writes. He writes with the mastery of an educated person because he was. He was educated to the minute he was taken captive to be a priest in their hot, the most educated of their, of their class. So now we're looking at him. He's been prophesying. He's been telling people for right on 12 years now, Jerusalem's going to fall. You might as well give it up. We're taken captive. All of Jerusalem's going to fall, and they're going to, and you're, they're going to come too. Well, and Jeremiah's telling him the same story. They're not believing it. And so they've got false prophets up there lying and say, oh, it's God's city, it's God's temple. God's done with them. He's done with Israel because they have forsaken his laws. They have taken idols and worshipped other gods and God, and, and he left the temple. And when Nebuchadnezzar comes in this third siege, which we're just getting ready to see, it is burned to the ground. The temple is so burned to the ground that it is said of the soldiers that they took their knives and they pried off the gold from the rocks because gold was still by but then it had melted so much. So this is the end of Jerusalem. And now we're getting to the point where that's happened, it's fallen, and now Ezekiel turns this way. He turns from past present and now he's going to look to the future and he's going to say but don't give don't lose heart and don't give up Israel 
because God's not done with you yet. Yes, he's punished you, and yes, he's mad, but there's going to be a day where there's going to be a Messiah, and He, you're going to rule and reign with King David, and that Messiah forever and ever on a new earth, and this is going to be the the glimpse of the glory that's coming and if you've not studied the millennial kingdom the very best book in all the Bible about the millennium is Isaiah he gives us a better picture I don't have time to go into his 66 chapters tonight but it's a great read and so we're going to get a little glimpse of that glory that's coming and we're going to watch what's going to happen and it, the, and this figurative language that has been so typical of Ezekiel is going to happen in the probably one of the most graphic chapters of all the Bible is uh, Ezekiel 37 about the dry bones and when I tell you what it means and you begin to understand his theatrical mind tells these people who are wanting hope and he begins to put the picture in front of them of dead skeletons raising to life hope is restored to Israel through this man and we need to get a glimpse of what God's saying for Israel. I say this again, and I'm going to stand on this. If you're at a church, or if you're listening to a pastor, or if someone's telling you that God's done with Israel, that the church has replaced them, they are apostates. It's a lie, and walk away as fast as you can, because here's what you have to know. God's never going to be done with Israel. Read Revelation 19 when he comes back on that big white war horse and rescues his remnant out of Petra. Read Isaiah when the promise is there over and over and over again. And then I'm going to take you through this dry bones chapter so that you understand God's never done with Israel. And if you can put a cap on that, you read Romans 9, 10, and 11, and the Apostle Paul will set you straight. God is never done with Israel. They are always his people. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not Jew. I don't look Jewish. I'm not. But here's the thing. I am grafted into that bloodline because of my Jewish Savior. And I am the church. I am his bride. And I'm grafted into the bloodline. So people say, are you Jewish? I say grafted in. I'm one of the adopted ones. But, but I say that in jest because there are real ones that are going to be saved in Petra in the Revelation story. And that's the remnant that's going to be serving with King David in the millennium. We're going to get a taste of that tonight. So I hope that's an, enough of a review for you. First chapter, I'm going to, I actually I'm going to take you through three chapters. So fasten your seatbelt because I talk fast anyway. Get ready. You haven't seen anything yet. This first chapter is short. It's 15 verses, and I'm going to read the whole thing to you, and then we're going to go back. And I want to tell you that if you've read Ezekiel 25, you'll think, I thought we heard this story before. We did, and we heard it in Isaiah, and we hear it in Jeremiah. I'm going to remind you that a really good review for this chapter, and I'm, I've chosen not to read it to you tonight, although I trust you well, is Genesis 27, which tells you the story of what we're looking at here. We're looking at an ancient rivalry, and it has never ended, and I will tell you it will never end, between two twin sons named Jacob and Esau, born to Isaac and Rebekah. And in the minute she's carrying those babies, God said, you have two nations within you that are warring. From the minute they were conceived, a war had begun between these two. It is, it is so today. If, you, if I turn the TV on on any news channel, I could show you this war happening today. It's to make it real, real simple. It's the Arabs against the Israelis. And if you want to know, you add the religion that, uh, that Muhammad brought in. It cu coupled with Judaism, and that's just, it makes the war even worse. So that's the ancient rival we were looking at. You have to understand that the twin Esau, being the older son, would have gotten the birthright, but it was stolen in a conniving trick by Jacob and his mother. We know that story. Please reread Genesis 27. It gives you a, a, an update on that. But we also have to understand this, that Esau was from the minute he was born was a rebel his name means red he sold his birthright for a bowl of red lentil soup he was given the countryside of seir s-e-i-r which are red mountains and he broke the covenant which later on we understand is a blood covenant so red kind of encircles his name I believe that there's a lot of importance in a name. <clears throat> We're going to understand that every time the Bible says Edomites, it means Esau. Get it straight, because somehow the authors believe you know that, 
as Jewish authors, they yeah. would, and they would assume that would be a conversation you wouldn't even need to have, but because I don't know that, I tell it to you. But if it says Edom or Edomites or the country Mountain of Seir, S-E-I-R, you're talking Esau. All those names will be interchanged, and you should know that. So that's the Edomites we've studied over and over again, and they hate the Jews. You know when I say Jews, I mean the Israelites. I'm going to use that as a shortened. But I'm going to jump right into this because we got a lot of territory to cover, and I'm in verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir. Mount Seir is a territory given to Esau. Esau, Mount Seir, Edomites. So get that picture right there. And prophesy against it. And say to it, Thus says the Lord God. Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against you. I have underlined that in the text simply because four words I would never want to hear God say to me. I am against you. I will stretch out my hand against you. That's twice he said it now. Remember the law in the Bible. A second repeat. If God says it once, it's important. If he says it twice, heads up. I am against you. And make you most desolate. I'm in verse 4. I shall, I shall lay your cities waste, and you shall be desolate. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. God is speaking to Esau. God is speaking to the Edomites, to the land of Syria. He says, I'm against you, I'm against you, and I'm going to make you desolate. Now, if that doesn't just chap your hide, continue on in verse 5. Because you have had an ancient hatred and have shed the blood of the children of Israel by the power of the sword at the time of their calamity, when their iniquity came to an end, therefore, as I live, who lives forever? So this is a good God way to swear. He's swearing that he lives, and he does. As I live, says the Lord God, I will prepare you for blood, and blood shall pursue you. Since you have not hated blood, therefore blood shall pursue you. Remember the word red plays a lot in the word of Esau. Thus I will make Mount Seir most desolate and cut off from it the one who leaves and the one who returns. And I will fill its mountains with the slain on your hills and in your valleys and in all your ravines. Those who are slain by the sword shall fall. This is bloodshed. And who's doing it? God said, I will do this. People that say, oh, God is a God of love. God is a God of love. Yes, he is. But he will not be mocked, and he will not be taken for granted, and he will not let unrighteousness rule. Continuing on, verse 9. I will make you perpetually desolate, and your city shall be uninhabited. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. There's that phrase used over 70 times in the book of Ezekiel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Why is he doing this? Because he's God. If you've ever been to the area of Petra, ever been to the area of the Dead Sea, it is desolate. It is barren. There are no cities. The Dead Sea has a stench about it that smells like um, sulfur and chemicals and like something the EPA would slap a warning on. It is so desolate. You look across and see Israel's mountains and there's fruit trees and walk prairies and there's everything and then you look across to Jordan where this is where Mount Seir is and you think oh yeah yeah you are you're still desolate there's still no cities there it's still true guess what it's not coming back it never will this is a curse by God against Esau the brother of Jacob now, a couple of things I just want you to know that that's an ancient hatred. It's not stopped, and it's not stopping. In fact, I want to refer to a very strange verse that the Apostle Paul says. One thing you'll know when you study with me is I believe there's no difference in the Old and New Testament. I believe they're just like this. And Paul says this in Romans 9.13. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. These are God's words. And why has God hated Esau? Because he was disobedient. I'm going to prove to you here shortly after we finish this chapter that Esau married some foreign women, did it to spite his parents. And from them Nephilim blood came. Nephilim tribes came 
from the lineage of Esau because he was disobedient to his parents and he didn't stay within the pattern that God set out for his people. And so I'm going to prove to you that Esau was disobedient from the beginning. It actually says when, when his blood, um, when, his, when his inheritance got, quote, 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 stolen, it says he hated his inheritance. He never valued what God wanted for him. Esau was a rebel from the beginning, and God told his mother that in the womb because God saw his heart. Amos 1, another prophet of a little bit, about 100 years different than this, and verse 11 says this, For three transgressions of Edom, Edom is Esau, and for four I will not turn away its punishment, because he pursued his brother with the sword, and cast off all pity, his anger tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. But I will send a fire upon Tim, and that's a city in the Edom, which shall devour the palaces of Basra. Basra is Petra. That's actually what happens at the very end. The Edomites get to take care of the last remnant of the Jews when they flee from the Antichrist in the tribulation. It's kind of a turnaround. Um, David has a lament. This happened years before this, but he sees it in Psalm 137.7. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. If you read all the verses that I gave you as a reference, you'll know this. That when Jerusalem was falling, and we're right on this now, this is, the time, this is present time for Ezekiel. That the mountains that surrounded Jerusalem, remember I told you Mount Seir and all that area of Jordan that surrounds Jerusalem. They were watching from the mountains as Nebuchadnezzar brings his massive army and lays siege for several years and builds up the big siege mounds. And the Edomites are cheering them on, go, yes, kill him, kill him. It's recorded in history. If you're a studier of Josephus, the historian of that time, he said it was daily they came out and taunted. They, they taunted Nebuchadnezzar's soldiers, kill him, throw the babies against the rocks massacre them. And these were Esau's people, the Edomites, daily came out and chanted against them. And when they were finally taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar's army in that final siege, they rushed into the city to take any spoil that there might be. And they rushed into lay claim. And God saw it all. He is so angry at the Edomites because guess what? These were their brothers. These were born of the same mother and father. They were twins. Now, let me tell you something. I, this is interesting. I'm referencing the new book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, written by Gary Wayne. And I am actually on page 193. If anyone wants to follow along, you don't have to. Uh, if you go into a depth study of Esau's wives, who were not what his mother and father picked for him. They wanted him to marry Jewish girls. He did not as rebellion. I am in the last, next to the last chapter on page 193. The Horites, by the way, were a giant tribe that were fighting at this time. The Horites were inhabitants of the region called Seir before the Edomites settled there. So before God gave Esau Mount Seir, it was inhabited by Nephilim, giants. And they were known as the sons of Seir that are listed without explanation in the table of nations. What is extraordinary regarding Seir is that he did not descend from anyone in the table of nations, thereby suggesting a distinct and different chronology, perhaps Nephilim. I'm just going to skip a little bit. What all this declares is that the Bible clearly indicates that the descendants of Esau did, in fact, merge with the Horites, and that's a giant tribe. So Esau's descendants married giants, the unknown indigenous giant race of Seir with no genealogical ties to Noah. We know from ancient documents that it was Esau's descendants that mixed with Nephilim blood to create giants. This is how rebellious Esau is. 
I'm not saying Esau was Nephilim. I'm saying his descendants married them. What do you think God thinks about that? Just saying. And that pretty much then is going to be the gist of what you're going to find out in this small in this short chapter. You studied a lot. I'm not going to go in great more depth because we studied a lot about the Edomites in the 25th chapter. What you have to know is this. Ancient enemies, always enemies, always against Israel. And every time you see Edom, Esau, or Seir, they're the same person. Now, there is a real twist that happens in the very end because God brings everybody back that has a willing heart. And at the very end, when the, in the last half of the tribulation period, when the Antichrist reveals himself, the abomination of desolation happens. He sets himself up in the temple. One third of the Jews realize, oh my gosh, we followed the wrong Messiah. Because they all start following him at first. And one third turn, because the warning had been, when you see this happening, run to the mountains. Don't take coats. Don't turn back. Don't, don't get anything out of your house. Run to the mountains. And one third do, and they run to Petra, which is Mount Seir, which is Esau country. And they protect them. Esau ends up protecting the remnant at the end. And so you're going to see in the end, in the millennium, Esau comes back and is restored, just like a third. Now, the sad part about that, if you're, if you're another person like me, and only one-third of the Jews run for protection, that means two-thirds are destroyed, and we learn that. That's two-thirds of the Jewish nation is destroyed. One-third saved, though. And every one of those that run to Petra, even the Apostle Paul says, they're all saved. Jesus doesn't lose one of them. They're all protected. But part of it is Esau's part at the end. So there's some redemption for that too. Let's continue on in verse 36. I'm sorry, chapter 36. This is The important highlight for this chapter, and I want you to pay attention to this real closely, is we're going to get the first and only glimpse in the Old Testament of the washing of water for the redemption of sin. That's real New Testament. Jesus talks, I'm the living water. I, from me flows living water. And always, but you know what? In one place in the Bible, in the Old Testament, you see that reference. And it's Ezekiel. Jesus is directly quoting Ezekiel. And it's like I've told you before. When you take the New Testament and the Old, they, they mesh. They cannot be separated. All these things, when we, a couple of weeks ago, when we talked about Jesus and, the, and being the shepherd, and he said that all the time, he's quoting Ezekiel. You see, the trouble for us is, if we knew our Old Testament, we could lead people to the Lord to be saved with the Old Testament because he's all over it. He's the new covenant. We're going to see it introduced here in Ezekiel. Only place in the Old Testament you're going to see this reference. I am in verse 1 of chapter 36. And you, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel. Now, I want to just stop here a minute. He just prophesied to the mountains of Esau. Mount Seir to the area of Petra. He he just prophesied and said, "You're desolate. You're going to be res never restored." Remember that? That was that whole last chapter. He's switching gears now, and he's going to prophesy to the Jews, mountains of Israel. Now it's a s direct switch. And you, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, "O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord." Thus says the Lord God. Because the enemy has said of you, Aha! The ancient heights have become our possession. Therefore prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God. Because they made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations and you are taken up by the lips of talkers and slandered by the people. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, the valleys, the desolate wastes, and the cities that have been forsaken, which became plunder and mockery to the rest of the nations all around. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, surely I have spoken in my burning jealousy against the rest of the nations and against all Edom who gave my land to themselves as a possession with wholehearted joy and spiteful minds in order to plunder, plunder its open country. A couple things that are inherently hidden in that passage. The hills 
of Jerusalem were used as worship for pagans. And God several times throughout Ezekiel and Isaiah and Joel and Amos and you name it, Obadiah and Micah, he, he prophesied against the hills of Jerusalem. Those of you that studied all the other prophets with me, it was it, God was always coming against the hills because in pagan worship, they worshipped up on hills. They had shrines. They had altars. They had sexual orgies. It was always on the hills. It was always against the mountains of Israel. Talk against the mountains of Israel. Plead against the mountains. Now he's changed it because we're starting to get a glimpse of that, that time's over. I've taken you captive. You've fallen in the last siege to Nebuchadnezzar. You're scattered. I don't leave you scattered. I'm going to restore the hills. I'm going to start giving you hope. This is starting to look at the hope. I'm prophesying good to the hills because the adultery has gone. You know this, that once they were taken captive for the last time, never again when Israel came back did they ever go into pagan idolatry again. They may not worship Jesus, but you don't see, if you travel to Israel... If you listen to their writings or listen to the, some of their the rabbis, they never talk about worshiping Shemosh or Molech or Baal again. If that's over. Once God's totally destroyed them, they never came back to that idolatry. So now what he can do is he can start prophesying to the hills, not woe to the hills. And now it's prophecy. And it's good prophecy. You start to catch, I want you to feel the glimpse of hope that we're starting to see in this whole country of Israel being restored. Uh, uh, restored, And we're looking forward like prophets do. We're near future and then we're way out. He's looking into the millennium. I mean, we, we're going to go 600 years and Jesus is going to be born and then it's going to be 2,000 plus years. Then we're going to go 7 years into the, to the tribulation. Then we're going to a 1,000 year millennium. And that's where he's looking to. And I'm in verse 6. Therefore... Prophesy concerning the land of Israel and say to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, and the valleys, thus says the Lord. Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and my fury because you have borne the shame of nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I have raised my hand in an oath that surely the nations that are around you shall bear their own shame. Remember, we've already gone over the section where he's named the nations. Moab, Ammon, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon, he named them all. Egypt, four, he spent four chapters on Egypt. And he's nailed them. And he's reminding them that. But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel. So he's restoring. This is restoration to Israel in the millennium. For they are about to come. For indeed I am for you. Look at the change in God's voice. He was against Seir. He was against Edom. He was against Esau. And now he's for Israel. And the city, see, I forget where I was. I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, all of it, and the city shall be inhabited, and the ruins rebuilt. Look, restoration, 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 restoration. I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bear young. I will make you inhabited as in former times, and do better for you than at your beginnings. I'm going to make you Israel Better than ever. This is promises, promises. Millennial kingdom. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Yes, I will cause men to walk on you, my people Israel. They shall take possession of you, and you shall be their inheritance. No more shall you bereave them of children. He's basically saying the nations have scorned you. They've made fun of you. They've tried to kill you, but they're going to be, they're going to be coming to you. They're going to bring their children to see you. When you read Isaiah talking about this, Israel serves with King David in the millennial temple as his as servants of the Most High. And Jesus is king over the whole earth and David is king over Israel. But all the nations come to see them. They want to come see Israel because they want to see this miracle that's happened. And this is the hint of what's coming. Promises, 
promises. I'm in verse 13. Thus says the Lord God, because they say to you, you devour men and bereave your nation of children, therefore you shall devour men no more, nor bereave your nation any more, says the Lord God, nor will I let you hear the taunts of the nations any more, nor bear the reproach of the peoples any more, nor shall you cause your nation to stumble any more, says the Lord God. Hint, 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 and this is another truth when you're reading the Bible. When it talks of nations, it's Gentiles. Never calls Israel a nation. They're my people. When he's talking about the nations making fun of you and nations coming against the Gentiles. And no more, not any more, four times he says that, no more. No more will they do this to you. No more, no more. Because you're my people and I'm restoring you. I want to say to the theologians that I've heard on the radio, and some of them are just really popular, when they're called replacement theories, uh, when they say, you know, we've been re we've replaced Israel. Well, you haven't read, it, read Ezekiel. God says, no more. No more will this happen to you. Now, either he's telling the truth, or this is all a myth, and you're wasting your time reading this. But if you study with me, I'm a literalist. And I believe he says the same saying yesterday, today, and forever. And what he said in Ezekiel's time, he means for the millennium. is still true. And God says to Israel, no more will anyone do this to you. No more. Thir verse uh, 13. Thus says the Lord God, because they say to you, you devour. Oh, I, we talked about that one. The devour means, means this. I had to look that up. Because Israel was so involved with cheating other people and being involved with crooked deals. It was like they were devouring anyone that would come and, and do trade with them. Also, they were sacrificing their children to Moloch. They were. They were devouring their heritage. Men, baby men, children. But that they, they were ruthless. No more, God says. You're done with that. And when that happens, when the third remnant does flee to Petra in the end of the tribulation, they get it. And they mourn for the one that they pierced. They get it. Continue on as there are 16. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. To me their way was like the uncleanness of a woman and her customary impurity. Therefore, I poured out my fury. God says, I'm really ticked off. When he talks about his fury, he's done it before. Therefore, I poured out my fury on them for the blood they had shed on the land and for their idols with which they had defiled. Two reasons they're being punished. For the blood they shed and they worshipped idols where they sacrificed babies to. Let's just call it what it is. They defiled the land. God had to take them out of the land because they defiled it. And he's going to pour his fury and because they worshipped idols. I don't know if you've read the Ten Commandments lately, but a lot of it's about not having any other G-O-D before me, and that's a little G, of course. Well, they broke that rule big time over and over and over again. So I scattered them among the nations. This is why they got scattered. They're still partially scattered. The 37th chapter is going to explain that and bring it back home. So I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. How many people think that's not fair? God's furious, and does he have a right? Absolutely he does. Even if he didn't, he's God. He can do what he wants to. But how ingratiating this is. This is the God that gave them the promised land and killed giants in front of them and gave them everything and they worshipped other idols really can we say America today sacrificing our babies on the altars of convenience by the millions and worshipping the God of money and prestige and throwing God by the wayside can we say America today I don't know that we want to lay the rest of the parallel there what happens but you might want to, and I'm in verse 20. When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name when they said of them, These are the people of the Lord, and then yet they've gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name. There's only one reason God's going to restore these people. Because he gave his word to it. He made a covenant. His name's on it. Because... 
But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake. I'm not going to restore you and give you the millennial kingdom and let you be with King David for your sake. Here's the reason why he's going to restore him, O house of Israel. But for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you want. It doesn't matter whether Israel deserves to be granted leniency. It doesn't matter. God gave them a covenant and he had his name on it. The only reason he's going to restore Israel is not because they deserve it. It's not because they're wonderful. It's not because they're anything special. It's because he put his name in a covenant with them and he will not forsake his name for anybody. And so, he, let me tell you the rest of the picture for Satan, in case you wonder, because it never made sense to me. Here's this idiot that's supposed to be one of the highest up angels that thought he could beat God. I mean, idiotic to begin with, but pride did that. So he falls, and he realizes God's powerful. He sees him create the whole earth. He means he's around. And suddenly, he, cont and he continues this fight with God, thinking that he's going to win. Why? Because... Here's the ultimate double cross if it could happen, and it cannot. If it could get to the tribulation where the devil could trick all the Jews, three-thirds of them, all of them, cause them to take the mark, cause them to follow him so that not one Jew is saved, then God has broke his oath. He has profaned his own name because the covenant's broken with Israel, and all bets are off then. And you see, the devil is smart enough to realize that's what he almost did before the flood. If he could have tainted the whole human genome bloodline so that no Messiah could have come, that every person living, it almost happened, it got down to eight people. If God had not destroyed the earth and that human genome had been so tainted by the Nephilim fallen angel bloodline, that there would have been no Messiah. God would have broken his word, profaned his name, and all bets are off. And that's the last ditch effort that Satan has, is to try to get into the tribulation and trick him. He's going to trick him for a while. When he comes in to make the, the treaty with him at the very first of the tribulation, he offers them a new temple, they're going to buy into it. Most of them are going to buy into it. But at that abomination of desolation, when that happens and one-third run to Petra, then why do you think there's these eight battles in Armageddon when the whole nations of the earth come against that little remnant of Israel? Because if he can kill them all off before they get saved, before Jesus rescues them, and the promise of the Abrahamic covenant happens, if he can stop that covenant, God's profaned his name. He's broken oath and nothing matters. And that until you understand the importance of God's name. God's saying here, starting to get a picture of that. He's saying, I'm only doing this because of my name. I made a covenant with Abraham about this, and I will not go against my name. No, you're not worth it, but I am. And so that's what this whole section, you need to understand what a covenant meant in the Old Testament. This is an interesting place too. Um, Ezekiel 36, this chapter, is the only place in the Old Testament that couples the water spirit with cleansing. And I talked to you a little bit about that before we started, what Jesus later refers to. Let's continue on and read that, and then we'll see what we're talking about. I want to go back and read 23 one more time. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, who, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. When I keep my word, no matter what you do before all the nations of the world, when I stand on my promises and my covenants and my name, no matter what you've done to me, the world will see that I am God. That's what he's saying there. 24. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. Then, this is the water reference that Jesus mentions. Only place in the Old Testament you see this. This is huge. Uh, verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, 
and you shall be clean. Jesus says those same words. I will wash you and you will be whiter than snow. I am the living water. This is Jesus referring back to Ezekiel's words in the 26th chapter, the 25th verse. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. That's a huge verse. And unless you understand, only place in the Old Testament that Jesus picks that up from. This is big. Ezekiel's really important. Jesus quotes him a lot, and that's what makes him so dear to me. God has several covenants. I'm just going to brush over these. We've done them several times, just so you know. You do understand the Abrahamic covenant was promised to Abraham and his descendants that they would be a land, a nation, and a blessing to extend to all nations that help them. There was a Mosaic covenant, or one called the Sinai covenant. You know it. We were given the law. We call it the Ten Commandments. There are many more than ten, by the way. The, the Davidic covenant, which we're not going to see fulfilled until the millennium, but we will see it. That was promised, and David was promised an everlasting dynasty. He would be a, per they're a perfect ruler, and that from his lineage, the Messiah would come. That's the Davidic covenant. Mary was promised that when Gabriel said to her, You're with child. From you. Will sit on your the baby will sit on the throne of his father David, and that's never happened yet. Coming, that's millennial. The new covenant, that's what this whole chapter um, 36 is about. God's plan of redemption through the covenant is perfected through the Messiah. This whole chapter begins hinting at the Messiah, the lineage of David that was to come. I want to take you to Jeremiah's 31st chapter. 31st verse, say that again about 13 times, and you'll find that Jeremiah up north in Jerusalem is at preaching at the same time. He's telling the same story. Here's his version of it. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant. This is the hint of the new covenant of Jesus to come, guys. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. God's going to give them new hearts in the millennium. They're going to turn to Jesus. They're going to be the best Jesus lovers you've ever seen. I can't wait. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord. For they shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. And if you don't think that's a promise... These are the people that have turned against God. And God said, I know that. Because of my great name, because of my promises, I'm going to give you another chance. And it's going to be hard. I am going to put you through hell. I'm going to send your people into the tribulation. And they are going to meet the forces of hell against them. And two-thirds of them are going to be destroyed. But you third that find me, that's my new covenant for you. You will be my people, and I will be your God, and I will never forget you. And those replacement Sarahs, read Jeremiah 31. God said, I will never forget you because of my name. I love this. And, and I think what I find, and the more I study this, the more I understand the beauty of what he did. Wow, this is a God that the people turned against him over and over again. And yet, because of his name, because of the integrity of who he is, he will not forsake his promise. You know how you know you're saved? Because he promised you would be if you ask his son into your heart. That promise is just as deep as this promise to Israel. Bank on it. I'm going to walk into eternity having no doubt in my mind that when I stand before God on my right hand side is his son. And when he says to me, why should I let you in heaven? I said, because I'm crazy in love with your son. He's going to say, well done. I know that. It's a promise. And this promise is the same for Israel. They're going to make it. But if you do not understand what the tribulation is about, and many people are confused about that. It's not about the church being thumped. We get taken out of here. 
It's about Israel finally coming to their God, and it takes the whole wrath of the Lamb to fall down on them, only to get a third of them saved. But it is a third, and it does meet the requirements of the covenant because they will be saved. All of them will be. That's what that means. I'm in 26. I will give you a new heart. See, this is being saved. This is the rim that's going to be saved. I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. The Holy Spirit enters once you get saved and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Do you not love the new covenant? Because that's our promise too. He gave me a new heart. I needed it. I'm in verse 28. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers and shall be my people and I will be your God. I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. See, he's restoring the land. He's restoring them all. And I will multiply the fruit of your trees and the increase of your fields so that you need never again hear the reproach of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. And you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations, not for your your sake do I do this, says the Lord. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. <coughs> Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities, and ruin shall be rebuilt. He starts, this is the millennium. The desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. So they will say, this land was desolate, <coughs> has become like the Garden of Eden. And the wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it. And I will do it. Count on it. This is the millennium promise. He's going to do it. I don't doubt that for one minute. Last two uh, verses in the chapter. Thus says the Lord God. I will also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for them. I will increase their men like a flock. Do you remember Jesus talked about the flock? We learned about that last week. This is that flock reference again. He's going to be under Jesus. This is a direct reference to Jesus. They're going to be his flock. Like a flock offered as holy sacrifices like the flock of Jerusalem on its feast day, so shall the ruined cities be filled with the flocks of men. They shall know that I am the Lord. That's, that's a huge, huge promise chapter. Now, I'm going to spend just a little bit more time. I know you're getting tired, but we got to do chapter 37. This is a big chapter. If you hear of anything ever in the Bible that somebody knows about, they hear the story of the dry bones. They go, oh, yeah, I've heard that Bible story about the dry bones. And say, what does it mean? And they go, uh. And you may have had that same feeling. I knew early on that it was this nation of Israel coming back to life again. I knew that. It did not make sense to me the stages that happened. So maybe I can explain that to you. And maybe it's a, it's, I will tell you it's not totally back to life. We are seeing, we were lucky in our time to, you were much younger than me. I actually happened before I was born too. But my parents, my dad used to talk a lot about, about when, um, in 1948, in May of 1948, when, they became a nation. Uh, he talked about that being a big deal. And for churches that were in touch, they knew this was a huge <clears throat> deal. That was just one stage. Is Israel fully back? No. But let's read in so we can explain all these stages to you. We're going to actually see three stages. They've completed the first two. The third stage will not happen until they are ushered out of Petra by the king of kings and led into the millennial kingdom. So that's what we're doing. I'm in verse 1 of the dry bones chapter. Cha Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord. Now, he literally lifts him up. This is a transportation. So we're not just standing there talking to the people doing little plays. God's going to show him something real, really big. If you remember the very first chapter when he saw the throne of God, this is, this is like that. And set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. People say to me, it's figurative. It may be, but I'm a literalist. I believe God picked him up and put him in a valley of bones. Now, you don't have to believe that. But I don't, I'm not smart enough to know allegories, and I'm not going to be, attempt to outjudge God's words. So I'm thinking it really happened. You can do what you want to with that. 
that he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley. Indeed, they were very dry. When you look that up in the la ancient languages, it gives you the picture of crispy, almost to the point where they'd been laid out in the sun. If you've ever seen a chicken bone or anything that the morrow's dried up, they're ready to crack, and they're very brittle, and they're uh, fragile almost. That's how bad they are. That's the picture you should get of those bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, Oh, Lord God, you know. Boy, that's a great answer. If God ever asks me something, I'm going to blurt that out. I'm going to be like Ezekiel say, You know, God, because he didn't know. He, I mean, this is God. Verse 4, again, he said to me, Prophesy to these bones. And say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you, and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am Lord. There were three stages there. Let me tell you what they are. I will cause... The first of all, he says, prophesy to the bones, and oh, dry bones, hear the word that the Lord says to these bones. The first thing, I will surely I will cause breath to enter in you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you. Now, I don't know if you know what sinews are. It's um, muscles and tendons, and um, not so much the blood and stuff, but more of the muscular, fleshy stuff. So that's that's the first stage, and. Bring flesh upon you. That would be like when he's going to put the skin. So he has to do, he stands the bones up, and then he has to do the, like the muscles and all that icky stuff. And then he has to put skin over that because they can't stand by themselves. So the skin is the second thing. But the last thing he does is he puts breath in you. I'm going to tell you, Israel, this is a picture of the nation of Israel. When he brought them back in 1948 to their land, that was the very first step he did. That was when he was putting muscles and sinews and maybe some cartilage, and, it, and he stood them up. That was in 1948. Since then, he's put some skin on them. They've had some prophecies. They've had lots of evangelism. I mean, that's been, what, 50, 50 years, 60 years. And they've started a little bit coming back to life. The breath's not in them yet. The breath's not in them yet. They're standing there. So if you, God's trying to give you a picture of how Israel's going to come back. They're standing. He's brought them out of the grave. Yes, and they begin. Now, they're not all back yet either. That won't happen to the millennium either. But they're starting to come back. So they're, they're a, kind of a skeleton standing there that's got the muscular system built back up and it's got the skin on them. But they're standing why you can say the Spirit's not in Is Jesus ruling them? Majority of Jews, are they saved? They're not. You do not have the Holy Spirit inside you. Holy Spirit, breath, wind, oil. All the same reference in the Bible for the Holy Spirit. All those words mean the same. And when he breathes the breath into it, that means the Holy Spirit's come in they've received Jesus. Has that happened yet? No, not as a nation. If Benjamin Netanyahu got him and said, I wish Jesus is in my heart, I'd be thinking, oh my gosh, we're really close. Because that means there'd be the nation would be turning to Jesus. I haven't heard that yet. Now, they like America, and we like them. We know to support them, but they've, they're not a Christian nation. That breath of the Holy Spirit coming into them, not going to happen until you see the third rush to Petra. So I'm just telling you, that's the way it's going to look. Uh, Isaiah had similar visions. I want to take you just a little bit back to him. Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead shall live. He was prophesying towards the millennial kingdom. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body they shall rise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. For your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. He saw the same vision. Now he's 500 years, couple, he's 200 years before this. He sees the same picture. Isaiah begins telling you, the, the, dead, the dead body of Israel is going to raise, and God's going to take him into the millennium. He talks a lot about the millennium. Ezekiel says, you're, this nation's dead. You're like a big bunch of dead bones. You're going to raise up. 
And God's going to breathe his spirit into you and you're going to live. Well, he's got him raised up. He's got him standing up. They are back in their homeland. Sort of. They haven't got all their homeland. There's a lot they don't have. They have some of their homeland. And they're standing. They have some muscular system to them. And they've got a little skin on them. But the Holy Spirit's not in them yet because they haven't accepted Jesus. That's this picture. When you see the stages of what Ezekiel's seeing, he's going to take you clear on through that. Does that make sense? If, if you see that, the, the way God's telling you it's going to happen. And by the way, it's happened just like that. No one thought it would happen in 1948. I wish my dad were here to tell you this story. When they heard it over the radio, they sat. he said, we sat around and went, oh. he said, we thought the end times were then. Because Israel is back in the line. But he said, we know it's going to take 60 years. But it was so phenomenal. But that was literally the dry bones coming to life. That's Ezekiel 37 starting. Has it finished? Not yet. It will. Just like the rest of it, it will. I'm in verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and sinews and flesh came upon them, and the skin covered over them, but there was no breath in them. Not yet. Not yet. Right? We explain why that has, hasn't happened yet. Verse 9. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath. That's another word for the Holy Spirit. If you remember at the Pentecost, the rushing of the wind, the Holy Spirit came. Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet. Now follow this very closely. An exceedingly great army. You are looking tribulation time. When Even though a third of them are all that get saved, when they rush to Petra, there were still millions, There's millions of them are going to be saved. When they rush to Petra, and they are in the clefts of the rock, and the Esau Edomites have to take care of them, and the Antichrist begins massing this whole world's nations against them. They stand up as an exceedingly great army. Do I think it's little? You bet I do. Do they have to fight? No. Because about the same time, all the earth looks up and the clouds part. And you know this story. That big white war horse sticks his feet there, and on top of him is the King of Kings, written King of Kings and Lord and Lord, Lord of Lords across his thigh, with the sword of the word hanging out, pointing at the whole word, and he steps down on the earth and he battles every nation that comes after his people. But waiting in Petra is this massively great army of God's people, that third that have accepted him and have taken in the breath of life and have breathed in the Holy Spirit and they're standing mighty and they march out with Jesus and he steps on the Mount of Olives and it splits in two and they, they walk underneath that split unharmed as he's battling these people in this battle of Armageddon, which brings the blood up to the horses' bridles. And all the time, this mighty Israeli army that's been saved marches under his feet and is saved. And he loses not one of them. This is the breath that comes to them. I hope you see the picture that it excites me when I realize you put all these pieces of all these different chapters and verses and books together and God gives you the picture of this mighty army that didn't even need to battle one sword because the king battled for them, but they're his. And never forget he doesn't lose one of them. The Bible asks how many will be saved. They all are. All of that remnant that rushes to Petra, not one of them is lost because of him. It reminds you of the Battle of Jericho when Jesus took on all the giants in Jericho. And Joshua will talk about not even having to battle. This is that same mighty army that stands up. And when it says mighty army there, I read one commentator says, this can't mean an army. This must mean 
a, a something kind of people. I went, no, it means army. God's able to write what he says. I think they're ready for battle. Look, they know the whole world's coming against them. They know Jesus is going to help them, but they don't know if they have to die first. You know, you know what I mean? I know God's going to help me. He might kill me. He's still going to help me. And so they're not sure. So they're ready to battle in Petra. And they are a mighty force. Number one right now, have you ever watched the Israelis fight now? I wouldn't want to go up against them now, let alone if they've accepted Jesus and they have the Holy Spirit inside them and they're amassed at Petra. I wouldn't want to go up against them then. But they don't have to battle. But it is a great army. And that's what I think you have to understand this picture. So when the breath came into them, they got the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, when you accept me, the Holy Spirit comes into you. You are a new creature. Behold, all things are new. They're new. They've got a new heart. That new heart we're talking about. Continue on to verse 11. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Remember at this point, Jerusalem's fallen. They're all scattered. That's e Ezekiel's present time. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Because when he comes in Revelation 19, he, he rescues them all by himself. You shall know the whole earth. The Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he's Lord. When that white war horse shows up and the whole earth goes to their knees, it's too late. They've taken the mark, battle on, and God destroys them. The Lord, it's called the wrath of the Lamb. The Lamb destroys them. Verse 15, again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, and take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them to one another for yourself into one stick, and they will come, and they will become one in your hand. This was him showing that no longer is there a northern kingdom and no longer is there a southern. They're one people. From this point on, God sees them as one. Verse 18, And when the children of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim. By the way, Ephraim was Joseph's son, so it is that same house. And the tribes, sure, uh, in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and that was always called the northern kingdom. Ephraim was called the northern kingdom. And I will join them with it, with the stick of Judah, that southern kingdom. Ephraim, Judah, join together into one nation, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. It's not surprising to me that he has them do kind of another play. This is who Ezekiel was. He was showing his people God is going to reunite you, northern and southern kingdom, so you'll never be split again. Verse 21, then say to them, thus says the Lord God, surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. He started it in 1948. He started plucking them all over the world, taking them back home, and then he's not done yet. There's got to be millions more go back home. Russia, Czechoslovakia, all of them have got to come home. And it's, and it's happening. It's happening every year. And I will make them one nation in the land. On the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols. And they never have. This is prophecy that's come true. Nor with their detestable things, nor with any other transgressions, but I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Um, replacement theorists. How do you take that verse out of the Bible and have any meaning to that? God says they're going to be my people. That's millennium kingdom too, continuing on. David, my servant, shall be king over them. Isaiah talks about this. David is king over Israel in the millennium. That's what God said. I didn't say it. It's his book. We know Jesus is king over the whole earth. He'll be Lord of the earth. 
But David will be king over Israel in the millennium. And they shall have one shepherd. And they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes. Because Jesus is king over everybody. But David is the king over Israel. That's how you know it's true. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt, and they shall dwell there. They, their children, and their children's children forever. My servant David shall be their prince forever. When you read commentary after commentary, it says, now that really doesn't mean David. That really means Jesus. And uh, no, no, David is not Jesus, and Jesus is not David. David is king over Israel, and Jesus is king over the world. Yes, Jesus is from the lineage of David. No one's disputing that. But David will have a place in the millennial kingdom. If you don't understand that, you're just not reading English, or I'm just not speaking clearly, or Ezekiel didn't write it right. Gee, I wonder which of those is true. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant. Here's that everlasting covenant forever. Here's that new covenant. Here's that promise of forever that we all get to receive into. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. We know that when the millennium comes, the new Jerusalem comes down, and that is the temple. And it comes right down, right from heaven, right on earth. King Jesus steps in, and King David, and all the Jews will rule in that temple area with David during the millennial period. Other nations will flow into that. My tabernacle also will be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The nations also, that's always Gentiles. That would be everyone outlined. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel, for my sanctuary is in their midst forever. And he just says it again. I sanctify Israel. Not like, I'm done with Israel, I hate you. No, 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 no. Nobody that talks about the replacement theory can read Ezekiel. They cannot. Or they have to skip some of it. And I'm not much for skipping anything. I'm going to take you to a place in Isaiah, which is a couple of this. And this is Isaiah 55, 3. Incline your ear and come to me here and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for the people. David is going to be the king of the Jews in the millennial kingdom. He, I don't know how God does it. He gives us all new bodies. I guess he raises him and gives him an immortal body just like he's going to do us at the rapture. I don't know how he does that. But he does it and he's really important to God. And I love that because David was so flawed. He made so many awful errors. And yet God said he's a person after my own heart. He gives me hope. That gives me hope. And that from that lineage the Messiah came who loves us and gave us the everlasting covenant. What The takeaway from Ezekiel 37 I want you to know is that God has started the raising of the dry bones. In the three stages that is promised will happen, two of them have been accomplished. That third stage where they get their new heart and they get the breath, they'll be in Petra. They'll be fleeing to Petra. So we could be taken at any moment because all those other two stages have happened. It looks to me, and I'm not a date setter, looks to me if you're dating everything according to Israel, we're almost there. They're standing. They've got their sinews and their other muscly things in. They've got this skin on them. They're just waiting for the breath. And when that happens, they'll be halfway through the tribulation in Petra. We will be long gone. Got a couple things you need to hear. Not that you haven't heard a couple of million tonight. <laughs> Hebrews 12. I'm going to bring Paul in because sometimes it's refreshing to get a New Testament glimpse when we're trudging into the hard stuff. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And I would take you back to Esau, that ancient bitter root. And by this many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that after, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, 
though he sought it diligently with tears. You think the Old and New Testament are separate? They're not. And let's end with one more from, the, from Paul. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I want to say this. As my dad was dying, he was um, incoherent for a few hours at a time, but right before he died, he opened his eyes wide up and he said, I'm going to see the great I am who makes all things new. That's what Paul said. That's what Ezekiel's looking us forward to. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for a chance to dig into the hard stuff. Thank you that I have friends that are willing to study with me and to bear witness to the truth that you just serve us over and over again with your great abundance of knowledge and goodness. I pray anyone listening to this, Lord, that doesn't know you, they'd ask Jesus this very night to become Lord and Savior for them so that as they stand before you, there is no doubt why God would let us into your heaven. We thank you for the promises that are coming. We look forward to you opening that sky up and that shout and our names. And God, we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.